So welcome back, everybody. I hope you've had an enjoyable morning break. Hi, once again, my name is Grace Mariuki. I'm the Strategic Science Manager here at Healthy Land and Water. And I'd like to welcome you to our next session, which we have titled Collaboration as a Superpower, Amplifying Impact. We are queuing up our first speaker for this session, who has sent us a video message as she couldn't join us in person this morning. I'd like to welcome the Honorable Megan Scanlon, the Queensland Government Minister for the Environment, who's here virtually to launch the report card 2021 and help us celebrate the Environmental Moni Monitoring Program's 21st birthday. Welcome. Hello everyone, can I start by respectfully acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which uh, I'm on today, the Yagara and Turrbal people, and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Can I acknowledge the Chairman of Healthy Land and Water, Mr Stephen Robertson, Mayor of the Redland City Council, Ms Karen Williams, and local government councillors there today. Uh, it is my absolute pleasure to announce the release of the 2021 report card. It is certainly the coming of age of this important monitoring and reporting program for South East Queensland Waterways and Moreton Bay, 21 years old and counting. The program provides a uh, regional picture of the state of waterways, catchments and the community quality of life to support a really coordinated approach to catchment management. And I think the fact that this program has endured over 20 years is a testament to the value the people of South East Queensland place on waterways and Moreton Bay. Uh, and the success of the program in driving a coordinated investment framework to improve the waterway health in our region. And as I stand here today on the 21st birthday of this large-scale monitoring and reporting program, it is, I think, important that we reflect on how far we've come. The improvements made to uh, environmental health in the region has been due to the dedication and leadership taken by both the Queensland Government, Healthy Land and Water, uh, the Council of Mayors for South East Queensland and the Sewerage and Water Utilities. And that coordination and collaboration across these groups is you know, really paramount to achieving our joint objectives. We're fortunate that through the investment made by these groups, we've ha we have a comprehensive long-term data set to support decisions on where investment is best channeled to achieve the greatest outcomes for uh, the region's sustainability and livability. And there are some really clear signs in the data that the enormous amount of work across the region in the last two decades is paying off uh, impressively. And in contrast, frankly, to outcomes internationally, we've seen some uh, recovery of seagrass in many parts of the bay, reflecting a reduction in nutrient emissions into the bay from wastewater treatment plants. And the conversation about South East Queensland's environmental performance is very much now in the international spotlight. And we all need to work together to make the 2032 Olympics a showcase for, uh, of, of, I should say, our sustainability. And, you know, at the same time as planning for the Olympics, we're experiencing huge population growth uh, with many people flocking to our region, which is, I think, because they're attracted to many parts of our environment, climate and livability. And while that growth and urban development and major construction programs provide great opportunities for our region, they also place pressures on our environment over the next 10 years. Construction works currently contribute around a third of the sediment and emissions to waterways and Moreton Bay and due to historical tree and ground cover loss, emissions from upper catchments also contribute heavily to sediments in waterways in Moreton Bay. Uh, I know we can do better and I know that you're here today because you understand the value and need for both specific investment and continued strategic coordination action across the South East Queensland region to improve these outcomes, uh, as well as increase our region's resilience to climate change. And it seems fitting at the 21-year uh, mark, the coming of age for the program, that healthy land and water is looking to the program's future and how monitoring and reporting can be improved to reflect those changing needs. Uh, I see the latest day you'll hear uh, about this new initiative, the Future Card, and I'm looking forward to seeing what this initiative can bring for South East Queensland and how it'll drive the conversation around getting South East Queensland future ready. Uh, I'd like to just finish off with the reason I'm addressing you all today. On uh, this, the program's 21st birthday, I'd like to officially launch the report card. And now I'd like to introduce the Chair of Healthy Land and Water's Independent Science Committee, Rod Connolly, to the podium to unveil this year's results. Thank you. Well, I, I suspect the Minister can't hear me, but thank you, Minister. Uh, 
Although we are streaming, so we don't know. Uh, there are people listening that, are, that couldn't fit in the room. So morning, everyone. Uh, so I'm the chair of the Science Committee, and there are many others from the Science Committee here uh, that do some good work behind the scenes, as well as all the workers that go and do the monitoring that I'm about to release the results of. So I, I, I've come up from the Gold Coast, so I live on Combermary country, so I'll acknowledge the people here, but also uh, down on the Gold Coast. Uh, in, in, uh, indigenous people, uh, el elders, past, present and future, and anyone in the room or online that, uh, that is from Combermere country. So uh, it's, it's my role to uh, talk about the results and, and the 21-year nature of the beast. Um, that's a different photo to the one in the program. Uh, that's deliberate. I, I thought, I don't know who picked the one in the program. It looked a bit like I was in the mangroves and the midges were biting or something. I don't know. <laughs> This is, this, is, this is more me in my natural habitat. So I'm, I'm a marine scientist from Griffith University. So the, the report card sums up a lot of hard work by a lot of people, and from, from government and from Healthy Land and Water itself and, and the universities and beyond. And it, it takes a lot of work each year to monitor the rivers, the estuaries and the, and the bay. And so I'd like to acknowledge that amount of work. And again, this year, COVID was an interrupting factor. COVID had layers of difficulty, as, as for nearly everyone in the room, I'm sure. So for the reporting and for the monitoring. So thanks again, everyone. And in fact, Julie, if you could just note for the, I know not everyone could be in the room today that, that goes into this report card. So if we could just take that back to uh, the workers, so to speak. So uh, it, it's a time to unveil the results, but it is, as the Minister said, 21 years of reporting. So it's a coming of age, as she said. So I, do you remember being 21? Uh, for, for, <laughs> yeah. for the Minister, it doesn't look like it's actually that long ago, uh, but some, some of you look like, it, like me a bit longer ago. So at, at 21, if I remember rightly, you, you know a lot by then. You think you know more than you do, and you still have quite a bit to learn. And I think so it is for the report card. Um, in my case, I, I was 21 before smartphones were invented, so I actually had to dig around for a photograph. Uh, <laughs> look, yeah. I'm actually, just, I'm actually just really impressed with the way I dressed up to go to lectures at university back in the day, really. So, yeah, so, um, so I'll, I'll now go to the results for the catchment. So these are, these are the grades that are released today for 2021 report card. I know that's small, and in, in a way, that's not deliberate. That's actually just that South East Queensland doesn't fit well on a, on a landscape-style slide. Uh, but you can see some grades on there in certain colours, and you can see under those the waterway benefits ratings. And I really do think the details don't matter. I would not have time today in my, slot, in my speaking slot to talk through what's happening behind all of those grades. Um, people working in the utilities and in councils will be poring over those for time to come and they'll be burrowing into the details. I actually wanted to talk more about trends. And the first trend I want to talk about, which is to do with the health of the catchments, catchment waterways, is to do with fish. So there is a measure that is taken, has been taken for 21 years, the proportion of the fish that are in an area that are alien or introduced or exotic or invasive. And the higher that proportion is, it is, is an indication that the waterway is less and less natural. And this measure has, over the whole of South East Queensland, in, it's doubled in 10 years. It's not easy to move indicators dramatically like that. So that's a very real change. And as an example of the sort of fish I'm talking about, Where am I pointing, Susan? Uh, so that's, that's tilapia, and that's an introduced species. That's a, it's, a, it's a beautiful fish. In fact, when it's, a, when it's living in its home country of Africa, it's really gorgeous. But here, because it's a, it's a very tough fish and it's a fec very fecund, it breeds quickly and a lot. It's actually quite amazing. It breeds by holding the eggs in its mouth and brooding them there. All very amazing, but it is definitely pushing out the native species, the native fish species. Uh, what can be done about those sorts of things? Well, quite a lot, and, and people are working on this as we speak, and there's a lot more can be done. Firstly, where, where genuine riparian vegetation is retained or 
restored, and I mean now overhanging trees, they shade the waterways in the upper catchment in particular and keep the temperature down in summer. And it turns out that this species of fish does particularly well in warm water right when the native fish are struggling. And that's one of the ways that it pushes out the native fish. So the more that we shade the stream, that we have the original trees there or get them back, then, then the native fish have a chance to, uh, to compete on equal terms. And the other, the other topic is the, is the removal of artificial barriers. Now, a lot of you will know about that in the room. Um, there are lots of artificial barriers to flow. And a lot of the native fish species need to go up and down the rivers, even out into the bay to breed and come back and live the rest of their life cycle. And so they are impeded by that. Now, when I say this, I, I also note that some of the very large, oh, so I'm talking about getting rid of uh, barriers that are not necessary. If, if, if we're using them for drinking water, then we need to think differently. But there are many barriers still, this one behind me, for example, on the Albert, uh, that can be gotten rid of. And in fact, this one is going to be uh, removed probably next year. One small note about that has to be done with something in mind that uh, there are a few key rivers that don't have tilapia upstream precisely because of the barrier. Um, I think I, people, have, people have named the Stanley, uh, the Lockyer, and I know in the Narang that's the case. Uh, so we need to be careful that we don't in fact promote the spread of these introduced species. Now let me go to the grades for the bay. And this is what the minister was talking about, that in fact there are some, there are some pretty good values. Uh, if you can see those from the back of the room, the scores themselves are quite good right at the moment in the bay. And overall, we, we give the bay an A-. minus. The key points are that, yes, things have been recovering, and I'm going to talk about some of those trends in just a moment. Things have been recovering particularly since 2016, numerically. Uh, there is less mud. I'm going to talk about that in a moment. The seagrass have been recovering. Uh, however, there is a, a definite trend towards increasing nitrogen. And I'll talk about all three of those things now. Firstly, uh, it's, it seems obvious to everyone in the room now, but back in the late 90s, when the bay was in trouble, or it was first noted that the bay was in trouble, so there was media, and then there were visionary people that have been mentioned already today, and together they came up with a strategy in 2000, and from that there were specific mentions of the link between what people are doing in the catchment and what is coming out and going into the bay and harming the seagrasses and so on. And I know you all take it totally for granted now, but just 21 years ago that wasn't the case. And in fact, that's, that's one of the wonderful things about the healthy land and water and, and its predecessors, that that has turned around. So mud, uh, well, it came down in enormous quantities. It has been for, uh, since people started clearing the catchment uh, in a big way, but in particular in the 2011 flood, that delivered uh, so-called 20 years of mud. And there was a lot of mud, and so the report card grades uh, went, went down. And they've been coming back up because the mud is gradually, without any new inputs, because we've had some, a run of dry years, the, the, the circulation of the bay has gradually meant that that mud which kills seagrass and, and harms animals, it's gradually been filtering down to the deeper parts of the bay and some of it escapes each year out into the ocean and is, and is dispersed. Um, we're not off the hook because, as you might have noted, if you were coming in by public transport today or, or by vehicle or, or by bicycle, it was wet. It's been a wet year. It's looking like another La Nina period. We're probably in it right now. So uh, with, with great rainfall, will come another dose, a very big dose of mud, and we might be um, in the same situation again. And the thing to do about it, and I know in this room people are quite aware of this, is action in the catchment. So that's keep the soil where it's valued, keep the soil where the productivity should be happening, not out in the bay where the mud is not wanted. The other, the other trend was the seagrasses coming back that the minister mentioned. So that's this is very true, it's very real, and I'm going to talk about it for a little bit because not everyone knows just how amazing this story is. Um, that's seagrass, so these are, these are the prairies of the sea, if you like. That's intertidal seagrass, and we don't normally monitor it using a helicopter. This was a one-off on the Gold Coast trying to cover a lot of areas quickly. Normally we have divers in the water, uh, we have citizen scientists, and we have remote sensing doing the monitoring. And uh, it grows subtidally as well. 
And by the, by the late 1990s, most of the seagrass on the western shore of Moreton Bay was no longer. There was very little left. Uh, and it, it had been happening for a long time. Uh, Bramble Bay lost its seagrass probably more than 50 years ago. This is just near the mouth of the Brisbane River, if you're not sure. And then a little bit further north into Deception Bay. Uh, while, while scientists that are probably in the room are watching, uh, because it was just offshore from where the where the fisheries department used to have their offices there, uh, the seagrass went missing in the floods, in the, in the reasonable sized floods of the 1990s. So that was the situation and that was one of the big catalysts for taking action. And so, as, as the minister said, there was good work on, on cleaning up the, uh, tre treating the sewage better that comes out from the urban areas and to some extent dealing with diffuse runoff to, to, to a, in a small way. And so, the water quality improved to the point where seagrass should have come back quite quickly, but we've noted now around the world, scientists have noted around the world, that but once seagrass is lost, then the nature of the seabed changes so that it becomes not very suitable for recolonisation by seagrass. So seeds, for example, will come in from other meadows and other parts of the bay, and they'll begin to germinate, but then the merest, uh, a strong day of wind, for example, will mean that that unstable sediment gets stirred up and the seagrass is lost and can't get a hold. What's happened in Moreton Bay is, and, and this is a story that's only told for about three places in the world, so you know, there's, a, there's a pat on the back required here for a lot of people. Uh, we held our nerve. The community held their nerve and kept the water quality improvement in place and eventually there was a period of quiescence where as in, as in the waters were quiet enough that the seagrass could get a hold, and once it did, it suppresses the, the wave action, and then the seagrass has be, been able to progress from there. Um, it doesn't mean that we will never lose it again. We have to keep the water quality good enough for it to grow, but it's a really good sign. And as I say, we're really one of three famous cases in the world where uh, that's happened. Nearly everywhere else, people take their eye off the ball and the water quality drops again, and the seagrass never comes back. Uh, so I'm gonna mention in particular Deception Bay came back, uh, the seagrass reoccurred in Southern Deception Bay 2016, Bramble Bay just 2019 and it's, and it's growing and expanding and there's, I just saw some results the other day from Golden Beach up in Palmerston Passage where the seagrass is doing rather well after, a, after not being there. So, so that's good news. Uh, nitrogen wise, so there was a big reduction in nitrogen going into the bay with all the work, uh, with the greater treatment of the sewage treatment plants. Through the, through the 2000s, and you can see, if you can make out the trends here, this is, this is nitrogen level. Nitrogen is a wonderful nutrient that increases plant productivity, but when you have too much of it, it, it essentially kills the bay. Uh, so it was trending down when the good work was done, and then there's the blip where uh, we have the, the, the big floods of last La, La Nina period, but this is, this is what has everyone concerned, that the nitrogen levels in the bay are, in fact, trending back up even through the dry years. That's not a good sign. And that's interpreted as, well, we, we're not really holding the line on nitrogen, despite all the good work. And it's to do with something that Stephen mentioned in his introduction this morning, that is the population. We've added another million people in. And, and it looks like there are more to come if you look at the, uh, the urban edges of the, of the city at the moment. On top of that, it's very likely that under changing climate, the rainfall becomes so-called peakier, as in the variability is higher. When it comes, it comes in large doses, and that will bring more nutrients down to the bay at certain times. So all something to be mindful of. I'm, I'm nearly drawing to a close here with uh, where, where to, but I just wanted to look back one more time to say, well, as I said, people identified a problem, visionary people with energy and effort, developed a plan, and then the plan was largely executed, uh, and we've had some good results. In addition to that, about five years ago, the monitoring of socio-economic factors began and gets incorporated into those waterway benefit ratings. That was a great initiative. And now we're looking to the future, which we're hearing about this afternoon. So there's a project for the future report card and the two, the two single points that I think about that amongst all the detail in that slide, one is, is making very clear, making conspicuous or overt the pathway 
from monitoring to actions, and back again, so in an adaptive management loop. And secondly, very clear incentives for people, communities taking actions, especially ones that we think are likely to lead to successful, healthy waterways. Thank you.